let's get this kicked off. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks, thank you to all of you for joining us for this R Street Institute panel on antitrust law and enforcement with a particular focus on concerns about big tech. Uh, my name is Josh Withrow. I'm a fellow with the tech, tech and innovation policy team here at R Street. Um, and the purpose of this panel, while we, uh, while the issue of antitrust enforcement, especially with respect to the so-called big tech firms, uh, has become clouded and surrounded by a lot of political rhetoric and hyperbole, there's a genuinely, in genuinely interesting and consequential debate happening right now between scholars and practitioners of antitrust about whether the existing antitrust laws and the legal frameworks that govern their enforcement are sufficient to the, to the task of addressing anti-competitive behavior in the 21st century economy. So we wanted to give you a chance to hear from uh, different and at times diametrically opposed views on this issue from some of the best experts in the field in their own words. And to that, to that end, I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists before turning this over to our moderator. Um, so first, uh, just going in alphabetical order here, we've got uh, Alden Abbott, who's a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center. Uh, Daniel Handley, who is a senior legal analyst at the Open Markets Institute. Uh, George Slover is recently hired as the general counsel and senior counsel for competition policy at the Center for Democracy and Technology, CDT. And Professor Christopher Yu, who is the John H. Chestnut Professor of Law and at the University of Pennsylvania Mary Law School, where he also founded and is director of their Center for Technology, Innovation, and Competition. Um, and with that, I'll, tur I'll turn this uh, over to our moderator, Sarah Oh, who is the Senior Fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. We want to thank her very much for joining and facilitating this conversation. And the one little bit of housekeeping I'll, I'll, uh, I'll get out of the way before I leave this in Sarah's capable hands is I just want to let the audience know that we are going to leave a few minutes for questions at the end. And please submit any questions that you have as we go along to the Q&A button down at the bottom of, the, of your Zoom screen so that Sarah and I can see them and pull from those questions more easily as we go along. With that, thank you. And, uh, Enjoy the panel. Thanks, Josh, and thank you to all the audience members um, here and our panelists. So to kick off um, the panel, I thought we would have opening statements. So about three to five minutes per uh, panelist. So we'll start with Alden Abbott, then move to Daniel Hanley, then Christopher Yu, and then George Slover. And so it's alternating, I guess, between different sides of the debate. Um, and so we'll we'll start with with George. I'm sorry, you said you're starting with Alden, didn't you? Oh, oh sorry, sorry, with Alden. I'm sorry. Yep, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks to the R Street uh, uh, Institute. Uh, the views I express today are my own. And I will be uh, sort of a proponent of the non-interventionist point of view. There, for the last few years, really six, seven years now, there have been, been a lot of talk by some scholars of neo-Brandeisians that the uh, economy competitiveness and state of competition in the American economy has declined substantially and there's been increased uh, economic concentration in markets. That's substantial. And uh, because of that, uh, tied to that, a number of many scholar scholars said, well, that means that antitrust has been asleep in the switch, hasn't been working well. We need much more interventionist anti antitrust. There's some disagreements about the form of interventionism. We'll get into it. But the problem is there has been no strong and dependable and believable showing that, that the assumptions are, are true. As the Council of Economic Advisors has stated in, uh, 19, in 2020 report, the argument that the US economy is suffering from insufficient competition is built on a weak empirical foundation, questionable assumptions. Um, Greg Worden, one of the leading antitrust economists for four decades, sort of leading policy economists in the Justice Department said, the modest upward trends and concentration observed for the U.S. at higher levels of aggregation do not indicate diminished competition. The steep upward trends and concentration observed for the U.S. in firm-based data reflect a bias to concentration trends that can arise from assigning entire firms to single industries. And most recently in a paper just a few months ago, was a comprehensive low cap at uh, Census Bureau data from 2002 to 2017, economist Robert Kulik uh, uh, 
found that there's no general trend towards increasing industrial concentration in the US economy from 2002 to 17. Even in industries where concentration may have risen, uh, the evidence does not support claims that concentration is persistent or harmful. Higher concentration industries tend to become less concentrated, while lower concentration industries tend to become more concentrated over time. Increases in industrial con concentration are associated with economic growth and job creation, particularly for high growth industries. And rising industrial concentration may be driven by increasing competition. For example, large, uh, when Walmart enters town, uh, rural area, uh, price competition may rise. So the, the short of it is one can agree or disagree about particular policy measures, but I think we have, it is wrong to say that something has to be done because it has been shown that competition has declined uh, and concentration has increased rapidly. No, it has not been shown. Uh, and I think that if one does, if, if the premises of rest on a foundation of sand, you have to look rather critically at all of the supposed solutions to a non-existent problem. Thank you. Thanks, Alden. Um, and next up, we have Daniel Hanley. Good morning, everyone. Before I begin, I just want to say thank you to the RC Institute for extending an invitation to me to participate in this discussion. I'm really looking forward to hear uh, the commentary from the rest of the panelists and the questions from the audience. So the prop today is have, uh, have the internet and the emergence of big tech platforms exposed holes in antitrust law or enforcement needs to be addressed? And I just want to say from the start, I, I believe the answer is emphatically yes. Um, you know, by enacting broad and specific prohibitions on business conduct, such as mergers, exclusive deals, tying, and other unfair methods of competition, the antitrust laws, working in conjunction with other regulations, were enacted to create a more moral economy, uh, to restrict business conduct to more socially beneficial practices, such as investments in research, development, better terms and pay for workers, and growth via internal expansion. And buttressing this, uh, were significant and potent remedies such as treble damages, divestiture, uh, to ensure compliance with the law and deter the conduct the antitrust laws sought to prohibit, as well as a broad private right of action. And uh, also supporting this was has Congress has repeatedly amended and expanded the antitrust laws, most notably, most notably the Clayton Act with the enactment of the Robinson Patent Act, 1936, the 1950 amendments, and the Hart Scott Rodino Act in the 1970s to ensure that antitrust played a central and vibrant part of America's regulatory apparatus. However, since the 1980s, uh, a melange of unfortunate circumstances, such as a dissident and hostile judiciary, organized conservatives and economists, ambivalent and disinterested Congress, and a consensus among administrative enforcers not to adhere and in some cases outright subvert Congress's intent have created an environment where the antitrust laws are unable to be adequately enforced. I wanna take a minute or two to focus on explicitly the judiciary. Uh, concerning Section 2 of the Sherman Act, there's decisions like Spectrum Sports, Trinco, 9X, Weihauser, uh, Weyerhaeuser, and uh, Linkline. Concerning Section 7 is Brunswick and Cargill uh, have all been eliminated private enforcement. Concerning the Robinson Patman Act, there's cases of Automatic Canteen, J. Stuart Payne, and Brook Group. And concerning antitrust in general, there are decisions such as Twombly and Iqbal, Associated General Contractors, and other Supreme Court decisions related to class actions and arbitration agreements that have enacted absurdly high procedural bar barriers to fundamental, uh, to fundamental aspects and have of antitrust law and have restricted antitrust litigation. Each of these events I've described have basically opened the door to an ever increasingly organized and capitalized uh, Silicon Valley to evade uh, the antitrust laws. And I just want to focus on a couple of pieces of conduct. Concerning mergers specifically, I know that's going to be a predominant part of our discussion later on. Um, between uh, 1980 and 2019, 700 the big tech companies, specifically Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, have been conduct have engaged in 723 mergers, facing almost zero certainty scrutiny from agencies, and those that faced any sort of scrutiny were quickly reviewed. Uh, this is sort of the sort of the broader trend towards. With one commentator noted that we're entering a, the seventh great merger wave. Predatory pricing has been used by big tech, specifically uh, Amazon with their uh, eBooks and their Alexa and Echo devices. Concerning tying and exclusive deals, big tech 
you know, run the, these two practices run the gambit of big tech's operations. Consider Google with its search engine payment system, Android operating system. Microsoft continues its decades old strategy with tying and bundling its software offerings. And Amazon has, has admitted to Congress of tying its e-commerce pl uh, platform and its uh, delivery fulfillment service known as Fulfillment by Amazon. Uh, we've also have uh, routine uh, inputs from the public and from litigation about the kind of conduct and the intent of this conduct, what, what these parties wanted to do with what they did uh, to show the predatory and exclusionary effects. And they routinely show that the intended effect of the conduct that big tech has wanted to engage in has wanted to crush rivals, lock independence, and extend and entrench their own market power. I also want to uh, note uh, an undervalued aspect of the, that sort of highlights the weakness of the antitrust laws right now, um, but is, is clearly indicated through increasing litigation and the interest of the DOJ and FTC that that will be changing. But a very clear indicator, and something I also think is important uh, from a historical perspective, is the input of the public. Uh, when the Sherman Act was enacted, there was an overwhelming consensus from the public that something had to be done with the dominance of industries and the monopolization of markets. Just here with the FTC's recent merger guideline docket, over 5,000 comments were submitted with many of them detailing the harms of mergers and pleading with public officials to use their regulatory tools that Congress armed them with. Um, I just think the record is pretty clear that um, the antitrust laws have not been as effective uh, as they otherwise uh, would have been his historically, but nevertheless, the door is open and we haven't, uh, we fortunately have an aggressive uh, uh, administration right now that is willing to use the regulatory tools they have left absent or at least considering the certain procedural hurdles that have been enacted by the Supreme Court. And um, yeah, we're, we're, the evidence is also pretty clear that if you look at specific markets, search engines, what operating systems, et cetera, they are all dominated by one or two parties included in big tech. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and next up we have Christopher Yu. Well, let me join uh, the other speakers in thanking uh, our Street for inviting me and for hosting this event. I, I confess, you know, when I have, when I get in these conversations, when we talk, um, I get a certain back to the future feel. So first, you know, the claims that the internet is completely different really reminds me of sort of the mid nineties when there's what we called internet exceptionalism, where we, we believe the internet was unlike anything we've seen before. We just throw out all the rules and start from scratch. And none of that mattered anymore. And now we see a spate of writing saying, you know, what happened to internet exceptionalism? And I think it's pretty clear that that notion is um, not really that vibrant, it's pretty much dead. And it's, it's one of those things where I, I find myself struck by watching this as a replay. But more importantly, um, I find myself really thinking about uh, the, the, the admonition, those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it, which is, um, we, uh, a lot of the debate right now is retreading conversations that we've had uh, for a rather long time. So partly there's a question about whether we should uh, uh, move away from the consumer welfare standard towards populist ideas that protect small competitors for their own sake and bring in other goals, non-economic goals, such as democracy and other social values. And the other is to really to, to think about structuralism and size as the keynote of, a, of what is big, of what the problems are, to go back to the Brandeisian idea of big is bad, uh, previously embodied in what was commonly known as the structure conduct performance paradigm, where we basically looked at raw market structure and inferred bad market performance from it, and was revived to some extent in the rejected proposals for no-fault monopolization in the 1970s and uh, a tacit collusion without agreement, pen uh, penalizing that as well. And uh, what I find is, um, you know, there's a certain amount of historical revisionism going on about uh, where the source of that is, and also an inadequacy to come to grips with the reasons why we moved away from those. Because as a consensus emerged that we did move away from them, and, and to grapple with the ideas about why that was the case becomes critical. So let's start on the revisionism. So one you know, thing I have to take a little bit issue with what Daniel said, which is Daniel talked about you know, conservatives you know, really pushing uh, the antitrust in this direction. And there's a uh, literature I've contributed a little bit to it, Bill Kovacic and uh, Bill Page have also, that points out that in fact, the modern antitrust law is the result of a cooperation of the Harvard School as well and the, associated with Arita and Turner. Uh, 
And so what you find is they embrace the consumer welfare standard and there it's actually, they provided a critical support for making it widely accepted and making that turn. And the case examples that Daniel gave, uh, Brunswick and Cargill on antitrust injury, that's pure Arita. That came out of, entirely out of an article he wrote. Uh, Brook Group and predatory pricing is pure Arita and Turner, again, their article. Uh, Trinco uh, didn't just stop at the price theory analysis that uh, some do. It had a long institutional analysis that's also pure Arita. And you look at the other decisions like Ninex and the like, you know, they're Breyer decisions. And so that's also very much part of that Harvard school. So I think it's a bit, you know, I, I, I caution this a little bit too pat to say, think it that way. And what we see, really what we're fighting with or we're struggling with is a broader based consensus that really became a conventional wisdom, not uh, that reflects a much broader political spectrum. The other thing that always strikes me is um, the reason we rejected structuralism is because of a, a vigorous theoretical and empirical critique that says just looking at market structure doesn't really tell you what the impact for consumers really is. So on a theory basis, we learned that uh, from contestable markets that large share does not necessarily mean bad performance. We learned from Stackelberg that a small share does not necessarily mean good performance. And that simply looking at a market structure without actually analyzing the effects and finding how they actually work out in the real world uh, misses something important and actually can disturb consumers in important ways. But more importantly, it was backed not just by theory, but by an empirical literature that really analyzed how markets work. And in fact, we discovered that, in fact, market size is somewhat endogenous to good performance on successive competition on the merits. And that one of the reasons that uh, many people across the spectrum re rejected calls for no-fault monopolization and insist on some sort of banned conduct by the actor is because of an awareness that, in fact, uh, it's often uh, pro-innovation or, or building the proverbial better mousetrap is what made the company so successful. And that, in fact, what we need is, is this vigorous competition among people who have now had the... Um, the playing field uh, raised on them or have the ante up, they have to then beat that competition or, or face extinction. And so that's the dynamic that was really what we often see underlying these different problems. And the, the challenge then becomes is creating antitrust doctrines that separate, that penalize the bad conduct without uh, also penalizing the good conduct. And in fact, what we learned is that many of these things that, uh, that modern antitrust law reflects that many practices are ambiguous and should be taken that way. Uh, the last comment I'll make really involves the importance of not just um, of structure but and statements, but on evidence-based decision making. You know, um, just you know, to, to I just think that the consumer looking at effects analysis is the actual critical part of that. You know, my favorite uh, quick example of this is in the AT&T Time Warner merger. You know, many people complained and uh, criticized uh, the decision uh, to, uh, of the court to uphold that merger. Uh, including um, the two organizations, two open markets and CDT, and uh, they had many people who did. And what we discovered is that fairly within just a few years of that transaction uh, going through, it was dissolved. So um, it's interesting how people have read that. I've seen all different kinds of people say it in different ways. First, on the one hand, it may show that the efficiencies that the merging party saw didn't really materialize. So to me, that's just the nature of business that someone's actually taking a venture and taking risk capital on something the fact most ventures don't work out. And so the fact that it doesn't work out is not a policy issue that deserves intervention by the government. The flip side is the anti-competitive harms that people predicted didn't materialize or else that company would still be combined today. The reason that the courts rejected that is a very detailed analysis of the empirical showing, which I think is the classic effects analysis, which is I think what we should adhere to today. And that is so much a part of the discussion and a lot of the DMA and other approaches that would take a deviation that would actually take a more purely structural approach. Thank you. Thanks. And next up, we have George. Uh, hello, and uh, thank you to R Street for inviting me to participate in this as well. Um, as Josh said, I um, have just recently arrived at the Center for Democracy and Technology, but I did come here with a previous uh, policy experience in antitrust at Consumer Reports and before that at House Judiciary and the Antitrust Division and the Antitrust Modernization uh, Commission. So uh, not as much depth as some of the other panelists here, but certainly a lot of breadth and a lot of thinking about uh, these issues. And um, so um, I'll start by just saying that the uh, CDT 
was founded more than 25 years ago when the internet was still in its cradle to promote an internet experience for consumers that is accessible, safe, secure, and satisfactory. Um, and it's against that backdrop that we assess the state of competition. So when we look at the um, tech marketplace now, we see a handful of giant corporate platforms uh, now presiding as gatekeepers over their respective corners of the realm, uh, able to decide who passes through and on what terms and costs. Uh, they are further fortified with troves of valuable data, which is combed from everyone who passes through. Uh, they can flex their power to solidify and expand their domains and stave off other contenders, seemingly impervious to challenge. Uh, but at the same time, these platforms are bringing us tremendous benefits. When it's in their interest, and it often is, they help bring creators and consumers of products, services, and ideas together with unprecedented scale and efficiency. And their size helps them do that. The question is, must we accept that status quo in order to get those benefits, or can we do better? Uh, a lot of us think we can do better. Competition makes a marketplace work for consumers and for all who seek to reach them because it creates choice, the option to go elsewhere for a better deal. And I think choice really needs to stay at the center of our thinking about competition and what needs to be promoted and what is um, a successful result. Um, competition and choice of spurs suppliers and sellers and intermediary platforms to offer the best deal they can with a variety of high quality products and services at affordable cost and to continue innovating to make their offerings better. However well the platforms are delivering now, competition will spur them to continue working to deliver better on both sides of the platform, the buyer side and the seller side. Enforcers and policymakers are stepping up to explore a number of ways to bring competition more into play here and doing so in a thoughtful and responsible manner, I would say. The antitrust agencies are pursuing investigations and enforcement actions under existing antitrust law, such as DOJ's monopolization case against Google and the FTC's against Facebook. But the courts have become more skeptical of monopolization cases embracing economic theories that erect high legal presumptions against liability. So we'll see how these two cases and others play out and what that may show us about whether existing antitrust law can be up to the task. The antitrust agencies are also considering new enforcement rules and updated enforcement guidelines, again, under existing antitrust law. Meanwhile, Congress is considering amending the antitrust laws, either broadly or focused on the online marketplace. The bills getting the most attention now are two in the latter focused category, approved by the Senate Judiciary Committee earlier this year. They address various kinds of self-preferencing by large online platforms. They hew closely to competition policy principles embodied in antitrust law, while also taking a lesson from the reforms of 30 years ago that opened up the telecommunications marketplace of that era to more competition. Improving antitrust and competition won't address every concern about tech. And at CDT, as I mentioned earlier, our mission is an antitrust, is an internet experience that is accessible, safe, secure, and satisfactory for all. And as we work to improve competition, we need to also keep other non-competition goals in mind. Two very important goals at the heart of our mission are implicated in the drafting of those two Senate Judiciary Committee bills. One, we need platforms to protect users against malware and breach of data security. And two, we need platforms to be able to set responsible limits on what information can be downloaded and shared so that users have a forum they can enjoy and feel safe visiting. We want platforms to do a better job on both those goals. And it is important that a new law to improve competition doesn't have the unintended side effect 
of interfering with that. So we're working with the committee in hopes of getting some adjustments in the details of the two bills to avoid that, while keeping the bill strong on their core pro-competition goal, which we support. Great, thank you, um, everybody. And so in light of your different perspectives on the state of antitrust enforcement, I thought we would go through the three topics listed in the panel description. And as you've noted, um, First, merger guidelines, um, second, FTC rulemaking, and third, antitrust legislation. Um, and so, like George mentioned, there is a, a current process right now of updating the merger guidelines. In January 2022, the FTC and DOJ um, put out a joint public inquiry for input on how to revise the guidelines. Um, it, the comments were originally due March 21st. Um, they were extended to April 21st. Um, and as Alden noted in his comments, there were 91 sets of questions in that notice um, with 15 different headings. And so the agencies really solicited um, views on everything related to horizontal and vertical merger um, guidelines. So I thought I'd start this section of the discussion um, on what your views are on what it's going to look like. Um, what do you think the process will look like um, for updating these guidelines, which happens um, maybe every 10 years or so? Will there be enough discussion and consensus um, in the process of updating the guidelines? Or do you think um, it'll be more political than, than it has been in the past? So any, any thoughts about the current merger guideline review? Um, I think Alden, can you unmute? Yeah, you're muted. Sorry, I had I hadn't realized I was muted. One general comment: the RFI, and it's certainly guidelines have been revised with new economic learning and new empirical learning, and that's fine. But there's been a gradual process, or really since since the 1980s, of uh, taking account of changes in enforcement practice and gradual incremental improvements. We don't know what will come out of this latest effort. However, the RFI questions, almost all of them sort of strike a, a sort of negative tone as if there's a predetermination that many practices out there are bad and raise all sorts of competitive questions. Uh, almost all the questions reflect that. And uh, there are so many questions, uh, there's a second problem. Uh, totally apart from whether there's you're listing theoretical possibilities, which don't really reflect the empirical realities or how agencies do things. Hopefully, if guidelines are issued, they won't try and cover dozens or hundreds of theoretical possibilities. That makes them ungovernable. I mean, guidelines uh, should try and reflect, and the agencies always in the past have said they, they re aim at reflecting uh, sort of in current enforcement policy, but uh, guidelines which just are li list, listing of theoretical possibilities of harm aren't guidance. They, in effect, are a warning to, to competitors that, well, uh, the agencies have sort of dozens of theories they might pick and choose from to, to oppose my merger, which could have a real chilling effect. And so you, you have to avoid, and that's something that a great the European competition law tends to rely on great granular detail in the past. We haven't, and, and our guidelines, although they have some detail, have generally uh, created a structure. So I would hope that whatever happens, that the drafters keep uh, uh, attuned to the need to have administrable guidelines, because as Justice Breyer and people involved both in the left and the right in the past, Democrats and Republicans said, if you don't have administrable guidelines, uh, you know, it, it really causes confusion and undermines the orderly enforcement of the, of the antitrust law. Uh, I, he didn't, might not want me to mention his name, but I had a recent uh, uh, interview with Doug Melibet, a very prominent uh, former Democratic Acting Assistant Attorney General, he expressed the concern that the guideline questions were so one-sided as to be tendentious. In other words, they assumed the conclusion. 
Yeah, and he believes in, in aggressive enforcement. So in, in other words, I, I would hope that the new guidelines are sort of evolutionary, not revolutionary, and, and uh, leave it at that for the moment. So um, I agree with a lot of what uh, Abbott just said um, and uh, what Alden just said. And um, uh, I'm an institutionalist um, and uh, you know, I want the process to be a consensus pro process and to result in um, uh, some guidelines that are going to be useful and workable and um, an improvement on what we've got now. Um, I do think a fresh look uh, makes sense. Uh, the guidelines that we currently have are 12 years old and they were written before all of the increased awareness and concern about tech. Uh, many now see mergers as an area where antitrust enforcement did fall asleep at the wheel um, as giant platforms were making many dozens, many, many dozens of acquisitions over the past decade. Um, we shouldn't pin the blame for lack of merger enforcement entirely on antitrust enforcers. They have to follow the law and they are ultimately beholden to how the courts interpret it. Uh, Section seven of the Clayton Act prohibits acquisitions, quote, where the effect may be substantially to lessen competition or tend to create a monopoly. The purpose, as the Supreme Court explained 60 years ago, was to, quote, provide authority for arresting mergers at a time when the trend to lessening of competition in a line of commerce is still in its incipiency, to break this force at its outset and before it gathered momentum. But more recently, the courts have taken a retreat, and what started as a healthy caution against over-enforcement has overreached the mark many would say, uh, reading that word may right out of the Clayton Act, stopping an acquisition only when the resulting harm to competition is most immediate and obvious and measurable in terms of price. In the online marketplace, somewhere between before that flurry of acquisitions started and where we are today, competition has been substantially lessened and monopolies have been created. So it's time for a fresh look and the merger guidelines are a good vehicle for that. Um, I like that the agencies are seeking public input even before they put out their initial proposal. Um, and the guidelines don't have the force of law as has been said, they have to stay within the bounds of the law, but they are a statement of how the agencies view the law and intend to approach enforcing it. And they're a point of reference for the courts as well as enforcers and for corporations and for everybody else. So uh, they need to be useful. Um, I expect we'll see greater recognition of the value of data as an asset and how it can impact competition across market sectors that on the surface may not seem to be in direct competition with each other. And I'd also like to see efficiencies claims put in their proper place. If I, if I may um, jump in here, um, I think it's interesting is uh, that there is, I think, a tremendous consensus to actually to think uh, in the middle about a lot of about revising the merger guidelines. And so one of the interesting things that happened is uh, the vertical merger guidelines were re revised by the Trump administration. And uh, whether uh, people agree with where they landed or not, those had not been subsequently revised since 1984 and not been affirmed since 1992. And we're no longer really reflective of existing practice. Uh, what's always equally interesting though, is um, there's also a, a, a lot of criticism of you know, the horizontal merger guidelines. And it's often a friend of mine who was a former chief economist used, used to say, only Democrats get to revise the merger guidelines, the Republicans aren't allowed to, and there's some political truth to that. But the horizontal guidelines that are being revised are, were issued by the Obama administration. And among some of the harshest critics of them are people who were instrumental in putting those together. It's an interesting thing that's going on. And I find it quite striking that uh, the FTC voted to rescind the vertical merger guidelines, the DOJ did not. And it's pretty rare to see those two agencies not work in concert in this way it's a, a kind of a disturbing sign that a world in which we have different sets of enforcement uh, consensus in the two agencies would be an unfortunate one, I think, because uh, we already have a lot of complications between having two agencies enforcing the space 
Uh, if they come out with substantively different places, that could be potentially really a problem. But I think that um, I think some of the, I want to just reinforce some things that both Alan and George have mentioned, though. Um, it, the, uh, the questions are more, they're just questions, although there are, there are, they do are somewhat leading. Uh, but what we hear is that um, unlike in the past, when merger guidelines attempted to restate existing practice, uh, many people believe or hear that the uh, current agencies are attempting to use it to try to change law. And that's going to be a very different exercise than what we've seen in the past. As George points out, it's hard to do with guidelines because it isn't until uh, the courts actually accept or reject the guidelines that it took courts a long time to do that in the past, that it actually becomes influential in terms of law. The real problem is, in the meantime, uh, we will have a great deal of ambiguity that will potentially chill a great deal of activity, because uh, we all know that often when something is challenged, even if it would eventually lose, uh, many people would be forced, would choose to abandon a, mer a proposed merger, even though it technically would comply with law, just because the trouble isn't worth it. And so I find a, a disconnect between uh, the merger discourse and what's reflected in the guidelines and what's actually law actually has the potential to really chill a lot of potentially good activity that can benefit consumers. Close to my two cents as well. So for me, when, I, when, I, when you think about what guidelines are supposed to be, they are supposed to be in, in conjunction with what others have said, you know, they are supposed to be faithful, a faithful attempt or good faith attempt to adhere to what Congress's command is. And if you review the legislative history, and the, really the only way to do that effectively is to review the legislative history. And reviewing the legislative history of both the original 1914 Clayton Act and the 1950 amendments to the Clayton Act, it is clear that Congress wanted to create a robust and vibrant anti-merger environment. Um, they saw mergers uh, to be uh, threatening America, the American way of life, inhibit the growth of local communities and destroy them. Or in, and in many cases, as the legislative history also makes clear, is to erode uh, democracy and degrade America's political institutions. And supporting that, it, it, it's important that when any of these, when these guidelines, the new guidelines are made, is that they adhere to that. And there is a plethora of case law that uh, done by the Supreme Court in still controlling decisions uh, just to name a few, Brown Shoe, Philadelphia National Bank, Vons Grocery, Rome Cable, and Pabst Brewing, uh, that support uh, Congress's original uh, intent with the 1950 amendments. Um, and it would, so in my view, that the new guidelines should be, you know, uh, the sprinkling of legislative history and the controlling case law would, would be a good start uh, so that they are uh, not just acting in a manner of their own choosing, uh, that, that they are faithfully adhering uh, to what Congress has intended and using the regulatory tools that they have been granted by Congress in the manner in which Congress intended that they be used. Um, I do I, I agree with many of the statements that George said. I would also like to um, mention a comment that uh, Alden med that med said that I also agree with is that they should be administrable. Uh, the, gui the guidelines should be clear as clear as possible and give um, uh, a clear indicator to both the, the public, uh, importantly, and the business individuals looking to adhere to what the law is. Um, and a solution that I think is uh, very appropriate, which encompasses both the incipiency test Congress clearly made uh, in the Clayton Act, both with the use of the word may, as George, uh, as George said, but also the word tend to create an ugly. The word tend also supports um, the incipiency aspect of the Clayton Act is that to use what the DOJ did in 1960, which was to enact a clear bright line rules demarcating when uh, a merger would, would be challenged under the law. This is what could be clearer than says if a certain company has an X market share and that the company they're acquiring has Y market share, that that merger would be challenged. Uh, such a case would also include, uh, would also adhere to um, dis, uh, dissuading businesses from engaging in the kind of conduct, which as the Supreme Court has said, it can instill controlling decisions, promote internal growth that mergers are, and I think it's really important to remember that mergers are just one method by which businesses have to grow their operations. And Congress wanted to restrict that one and promote other areas such as investments in infrastructure, uh, 
uh, or, or research and development and other avenues for internal expansion. Um, that's what I would like to see in the guidelines is clear bright, bright and rules as models from the 1968 uh, guidelines, which I think would both adhere to the legislative, uh, the congressional, um, sorry, legislative history, and as well as be supported by the numerous still controlling cases from the Supreme Court. Thanks. And before we move on to the other two um, topics, just a thought, um, well, what if the DOJ and FTC just incrementally adjust the guidelines? Um, what would you think of that? You know, lowering the HHI threshold, lowering the Hart Scott Rodino threshold, just um, is that a possibility or will it be revolutionary, like a complete overhaul? What, what do you think their, um, the approach might be? A question to me, or is it sorry? <laughs> Generally, I mean, I guess to you, yes. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I, I would. Uh, I guess I'll just, I'll, I'll just start, and I'll, then I'll, I'll let other other people talk. <laughs> As, uh, I think that would be a good start. I mean, changing the uh, HSI levels are, um, you know, have been done routinely in the past. They've been no noticeably uh, increased. I think the largest increase was from the 2010 to the uh, the 1990. Uh, guidelines. That was a pretty noticeable increase. So that's that's a pretty routine practice. I still don't think that that is, a, that is effective. Again, the merger guidelines as they're currently written give numerous loopholes, numerous reasons why a merger would be challenged or not challenged and legal or illegal. They don't really give the kind of clarity that the rules governing the marketplace should give. I mean, and, and again, antitrust is quite unique in this. There are other areas of law that are much clearer to, to administer. Uh, that giving clear, bright line indicators of what conduct is illegal and when it is illegal. Um, but I, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll feed into the question is that yes, those would be those would be good changes, although they wouldn't be, in my opinion, the most optimal changes for the DOJ and FTC to take. I would say that a, um, a top to bottom look is um, in order. Um, I don't think that has to lead to a top to bottom uh, change in what we've got. Um, I don't know how you are defining incremental, but I think it could be, you know, a nip and tuck here and there, um, adding a few new uh, aspects that, um, that uh, bring the, um, the tech uh, marketplace a little bit more sharply into focus, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and, um, but, but I don't think it has to be revolutionary. You know, what's quite striking to me is the biggest change in the 1990 Obama merger guidelines was the emphasis on effects analysis and looking at direct evidence of anti-competitive effects and saying, if you can actually show that, we don't even need to do the exercise of market definition, which has been the churn has added so much in the litigation and, and created so much of the uncertainty. And to me, this is the kind of evidence-based effects analysis which modern um, econo econometric techniques have made possible and something we've always wanted. Now, what does that mean? Um, it, it avoids the simple inferences from market share, which we know aren't really valid anymore, is that it missed, it's both over and under enforcing at different times and actually taking advantage of the state of the art and really looking at effects. And in fact, what you see in a lot of the literature, you know, I, I remember um, Francie LaFontaine and Margaret Slade, one of whom was a chief economist for the FTC uh, during the Obama administration, did an empirical study of, of vertical mergers and discovered that 95% of the time they actually were beneficial to the consumers are neutral and only 5% of the time were they harmful. And so what we find is there's a lot of theories where we can find possible ideas of where they can be harmful, but the idea of going back to actual evidence and data is really critical. Uh, the last thing I'll say is about lowering HS, HSR thresholds as opposed to the merger, the HHI ones. Um, when China was setting up its antitrust regime for the first time, not that long ago, the U.S. antitrust officials cautioned them against setting those thresholds too low. Why? Because you would end up reviewing an awful lot of mergers which were extremely unlikely to have any competitive effects. And they warned that if you're going to actually manage an agency, you have to make sure you focus on the right things. And that, in fact, um, they warned specifically them against the idea of actually having thresholds that are too low. And so I'd be a little, I'd take that as a cautionary note. Just to be uh, on the other side and point to a few points that uh, FTC Commissioner Wilson has made in some of her articles that look, yeah, apart from competitive harm, uh, 
if a particular merger is going to bring about major synergies, for example, uh, bringing together complementary assets may, may ensure assets are better used, uh, eliminate in the case of vertical mergers, so-called multiple markups, double marginalization, uh, that, that should be uh, ignored. And, and moreover, there's, there's a risk, she argued, in some cases by rather narrow uh, uh, definitions of markets, sometimes, sometimes ignoring potential major benefits to consumer welfare and consumer surplus in general and other adjoining markets. And philosophy saying, well, if we can find a narrow, very narrow group of buyers and sellers, it can identify harm. This is always predictive, never certain. So I'm just saying to throw that out, not saying anyone's going to do that, but I think the potential benefits of mergers and the potential risks and errors involved that might lead to over enforcement should not be ignored. Although to be honest, I'm not counting, I'm not counting my chickens. I doubt you're going to see much of that in whatever new guidelines emerge. Great. And I guess with the last few minutes that we have before any audience questions, I don't see any audience questions yet. So if any audience members have questions, please um, fill them in. Okay, great. We have some. Um, but for now, um, before we move on to questions, just want to tee up two more topics, um, the FTC rulemaking authority and new antitrust legislation um, introduced um, in, in the Senate and House. Um, any thoughts about F the FTC's use of rulemaking? In last July, um, they changed their rules of practice to allow for Section 18 trade regulation rules um, to presumably do more rulemaking. Um, I don't know what direction they'll go in with that, um, possibly writing rules about data practices, um, maybe a mix of privacy plus competition. Um, it, that seems to me more open-ended, um, uncertain. Um, any thoughts about, about rulemaking or um, we can discuss also the different antidress bills um, on self-preferencing and, and so on. And, and just a couple of thoughts. There's also been a lot of discussion and Chair Khan in the past also mentioned potential section 6G rules under section 6G, section 6G of, the R, of the FTC Act has a short reference, passing reference to rules and uh, the thought is that various competitive practices might be subject to those rules. I and other people have written, scholars will disagree, but I think it's highly unlikely that such rulemakings would succeed legally. Just having the, been general counsel when the FTC lost its AMG case, I think the Supreme Court and taking and the appellate court taking cue from that will be very reluctant to find a new sweeping authority to do substantive rules despite this one 50 year old dated case that suggests that there is that authority. So I just think before rushing ahead and doing such rules, given the huge risk they'd be, they'd be struck down, do you really wanna use your resources in that way? And there's a second question and some scholars point out, look, once you have a rule there, it's very rigid, uh, apart from, per, from hardcore collusion, things like that sort, generally antitrust proceeds by case by case, uh, analysis based on the facts, on empirics, and a hard and fast rule creates a lot of error cost. And in fact, it creates a sort of per se rule for certain conduct. Also adds a confusion because the Justice Department doesn't have antitrust rulemaking authority. So it might lead to confusion about, well, who's going to get uh, oversight over a particular activity if the FTC grabs this particular uh, uh, transaction is it going to fall under illegality or under one of those rules, which I think jurisprudentially and rule of law, uh, those are very questionable and problematic uh, possibilities. But we'll see what happens. I think there, uh, consumer protection section 18, the, the uh, rules are less legally problematic. But uh, again, I think the Supreme Court in general is taking a much harder look at the authority for rulemaking by uh, agencies. Any other thoughts about rulemaking? Okay, and then um, yes, there's plenty. Um, of 
just to, to, to talk less about, you know, just to echo one thing uh, Alden said about rulemaking. You know, I do think that he analogized it as I have in my writing to um, per se legality, which is what rules tend to be. Now, we don't know what the form of the rules are going to be. But what we've learned is case by case specific analysis is the default. And you do that when you, uh, you only deviate from that when you're really familiar with a practice and are really confident that you know what the effects are going to be. And to me, um, that's the antithesis of what we have a lot in big tech, which is we've seen a lot of the remedies, a lot of things people tried about um, in terms of scraping, and it's had very unexpected effects in other parts of the world where they've attempted to change these things. And it's an ecosystem, and we all know that um, that you squeeze one part of the balloon, something is going to bulge out someplace else. And so what I find is that um, uh, it's a cautionary note not to go that way. What um, Alden didn't talk a lot about, I'll, I'll talk about is the antitrust legislation about self-preferencing. And to put this in a very concrete way, you know, Elizabeth Warren uses an example, which is she would uh, talk, complain about private label Amazon goods being preferred by Amazon. In particular, her case example was batteries. And my colleague Herb Hovenkamp has a nice a short article in the regulatory review that points out, in fact, private label and those of us who've been in branded products, and I've, I did some work, is sort of the bane of the existence of the would-be monopolies because they're low, good quality, low-cost goods that are extremely competitive. And the point that they would, and that are extremely beneficial for consumers. And that one of the points that Herb makes is if you look at price cost margin, batteries are one of the worst sectors and one of the areas where you'd like to promote as much visible price competition as possible and that, in fact, allowing uh, people to highlight private label brands would often be very, very good for consumers. And so this is an example of sort of a more nuanced analysis. Instead of saying all self-preferencing is bad, we should put consumers first and really look at the way antitrust traditionally has on a case-by-case -case basis and really analyze not just theoretical possibilities, because most of them are ambiguous. Whether or not, we do have nice, clean rules. But we know with things like vertical arrangements, they tend to be ambiguous and that you can't really resolve them with simple rules without actually putting a lot of harming consumers in, in, you know, inadvertently in the process. And so I think that that is a great example of why we wouldn't necessarily want a blanket self-preferencing rule and we'd want to have a more nuanced analysis that would take the case, the, the individual situations into account. speak a little bit on this. So I, I think what's important is, is there's been, there was two uh, statements made about the case by case approach. And I, I just think it's important to put this into context is that conduct like exclusive deals or mergers have been repeatedly litigated. These are not, these are not, this is not conduct that is novel or is that we have very little experience. I mean, the FTC uh, and other enforcers spent an enormous amount of time making, uh, Looking, looking through litigation, engaging in very long, as, as antitrust is notorious for, um, and protracted litigation regarding mergers and exclusive deals. And it seems to me that also we, when we look at evidence of how these deals are, uh, of how these practices are used, both mergers and uh, exclusive deals, tines, et cetera, um, the adverse effects of them are clear in, in, in certain circumstances. And so when, I, when we think about a rule, a rule doesn't have to be a complete per se ban in any and all cases, that a rule can also be modified and applied in such a manner, which that for most of the, for mo in most cases, or that it could be, a rule could be tailored yeah. in the sense that in X and Y cases, they could be prohibited and, and legal in other cases. So for example, in the, in the in a petition before the Federal Trade Commission, of which the organization that I'm a part of submitted along with other, uh, other advocacy organizations, we advocated that exclusive deals were prohibited they substantially for close competition and gave a certain a list of circumstances which that would trigger. And the general one is that if a company has 30% market share or more, they would be illegal and then if they weren't, uh, they would not be illegal. And so you can use, you can look at, ev look at evidence of how these practices are used and tailor rules such, such that it's target only the most uh, overtly or even um, most uh, in certain in circumstances where their conduct is mostly harmful and create a situation where they also can be used. Um, I will also say, I think the, no, you know, I'll just, I'll just end it there. I'll just end it there. Okay. Um, and then we'll tee up, I'll, I'll share one audience question. Um, are there any 
countries that are doing um, things radically different from the American approach, like in India, um, perhaps they're not allowing mergers above a certain purchase price, like a very uh, aggressive um, merger enforcement policy. Um, and maybe even Europe, Europe might be a good example. How, how does the US um, compare with Europe? And, and is this the direction that current um, reformers want to go? Uh, well, thanks, Sarah. Actually, Europe uh, in the last decade or so has been much more moving towards what some scholars call uh, uh, and, uh, precautionary principle antitrust. There's, for example, there's something called Digital Markets Act, which was a rule, ex ante rule, that would apply to certain large platforms. And we uh, deal with a variety of practices and perhaps mandate interoperability, a number of other things. Uh, the US and Europe have, have cooperated a lot on, on merger analysis. Uh, but I mean, I think Europe generally in treating dominant uh, and looking at dominant firms has been more suspicious of, of accepting efficiencies, has been uh, readier to condemn conduct that may be efficient, and now uh, is really heading in the direction of, of favoring uh, uh, soft regulation or even harder regulation of, of certain disfavored large companies. And uh, in fact, there's been talk by both the head of the of the Competition Commission in Europe and Chair Khan about convergence and moving closer together, which you know certainly suggests uh, 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 not add to uh, that's good thing. I think it's not a good thing. If you look at Europe, has uh, not produced any of the great innovative platforms. Innovators uh, have a harder time. The stat the culture is less uh, supportive of innovation and of entrepreneurship. That's why lots of Europeans, some of them I know, have moved from Europe. And to the extent we start emulating sort of regulatory approaches to competition in the United States, you're gonna undermine American innovation. So I'd like to see, the, um, see us try the American approach for a while longer to see if we can make that work. Um, I think the uh, Klobuchar-Grassley bill is trying to do that. It has um, sort of distilled some antitrust principles, I think, uh, very well into a kind of self-preferencing uh, prohibition that um, is based on antitrust principles. It's um, got a lot of concrete terminology that uh, antitrust lawyers and economists don't like because it doesn't include the terminology that they're familiar with from the antitrust cases. But uh, I think they've done a pretty good job in hewing to antitrust principles and it's gone through several iterations and I think it's gotten better and better. And as uh, I mentioned earlier, and we're kind of running out of time, I see, but we've got some sort of what some people would call tangential issues uh, that we think are very important that you know we need to preserve the ability of the online platforms as a place that users can feel safe going and um, that uh, a law that is written to uh, protect competition doesn't inadvertently feed into these other areas. We need courts to have enough guidance to be able to distinguish between um, uh, restrictions that are imposed for anti-competitive purposes and uh, restrictions that are imposed for some of these other uh, purposes. Well, to me, probably the, the biggest innovation, the biggest country that's doing something different is Europe with the Digital Markets Act, where they have certain pure size thresholds that actually don't measure effects. They don't measure even share or dominance. If you, if you exceed them, you're automatically liable. And they have a rather long list of remedies that directly applies uh, in rather uh, Procrustean fashion without really understanding the problems that are issued and uh, whether they'll actually solve them. And what's fascinating to me is there's actually in, in my conversations, a lot of European scholars, even fairly pro-enforcement scholars who are, who are not big fans of this approach. And so um, I find a bit of that reflected in the Klobuchar-Grassley bill. Uh, the, um, the, uh, 
definitional threshold approach as opposed to a more uh, direct analysis of effects and also a more uh, traditional market power analysis, I think has considerable risk of, of overreaching quite a bit. And I think that that's a potential problem. The other thing that, you know, and this is to go back to something that Daniel mentioned earlier about some of the mergers here. And one of the questions in the chat talks about um, the Google Android acquisition. We forget that when, um, when Google bought Android, it was a defensive action at a time when Apple iOS looked like they were gonna run away with the market. And they acquired the company, which I think the numbers are at the time, Android had 10 employees and no revenue. And there's a wonderful question about whether um, that Android is successful because of the investments Google's made or if they were trying to buy them out. And what I find really interesting is the nature of open source operating systems is you can always go back to the original source code the way um, Amazon did with Fire OS. Uh, Tizen, Samsung's trying to be trying to do that with Tizen and Huawei's been trying to do that as well uh, with a tremendous desire and a lot of resources and have not succeeded. And so to me, there's a pretty interesting argument that in fact, the reason that that, that product is so successful is because of innovation and people have made a willingness to make investments and to make something that works very well. The bigger, no, on, a, on a more, a less, uh, more abstract note, the challenge will be is to fashion antitrust doctrines that actually penalize, uh, that block anti-competitive conduct without also blocking pro-competitive conduct. Because what the problem you're hearing from people, innovators in Silicon Valley, is that they have different exit strategies. Sometimes it's IPO, but sometimes it's exit through sale to another company. And um, reducing the size of their market is not a way to promote their innovation. Um, and, and, if we do that to companies who had no real chance of actually going IPO or doing something else, then we're actually gonna really be hurting innovation in ways that I think would be uh, unforeseen, is not what the people who are pushing additional intervention here really are intending. I agree with a lot of that. Um, and I would just say that, um, I try to stay focused and I hope others stay focused on competition as distinct from competitiveness, which has become kind of a synonym for strong companies. And um, you know, the goal of antitrust is not to create strong companies, it's to create competition. Uh, and strong companies can be a contributor to that, but that's not the end in itself. Great, and any final thought, Alden, your hand is up. Oh, uh, well, I'll just mention that I think everyone's made some good points. I am a little concerned about the global Gasly bail that there are lots of new terms which will be interpreted different ways by judges if the act were to be passed when, uh, and which again is gonna create delays and uncertainty. And, and also, you know, with the best of intentions, I think some of the bars say on price discrimination, on self, self preferencing we've talked to the references to unfairness could dampen incentives to innovate and to do things that actually benefit consumers, including price discounting. Again, while we're talking in, in, in theoretical terms, that, but I think those are real potential risks. Great. And on that note, we'll, we'll keep watching all these different developments in antitrust enforcement, legislation, rulemaking, um, administrative law. Thank you to the panelists and thank you to R Street and Josh um, for hosting this panel. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you.